so Beowulf is losing. He looks death in the face and stays and continues to fight, even though he knows he can't win. Um, this is what separates Beowulf from Grendel or Unferth or any of the other cowards that we've seen so far. In fact, it said before he went down the cliff that he'd never known fear. So on some level, Beowulf is sort of uh, fearless, uh, which I think is, is an important moment as well. Um, and now that Beowulf is losing, of the 12 guys that came with him, 11 have run away, and one stands there miserable, remembering as a good man must what kinship should mean. Now, this is somebody who's related to Beowulf by blood, and so uh, he knows what he has to do. And I think it's interesting that it says he's miserable, as opposed to Beowulf, who views battles as an opportunity to prove himself. This guy looks down and watches the dragon like burning Beowulf, and it's like, oh, crap, I got to go down there. Um, and we get introduced to him in chapter 36. So his name was Wiglaf. He was Wexton's son and a good soldier. His family had been Swedish once. All right, so a little bit of background. We find out his name is Wiglaf, son of Wexton, uh, which if you're paying attention to Anglo-Saxon naming traditions means he's normal. His name alliterates with his dad's name, just like Rothgar was um, the son of uh, Half Dane. So, like, if you have a character whose name alliterates, it's sort of an indication that there's nothing, nothing special. There's nothing in incredible going on in their backstory, as opposed to Beowulf and Edge, though. So he's regular. He's a normie. Um, he's a good soldier. His family had been Swedish once. So, um, what you find out, like, if you go back and you look at like the the anthologies, anthologies genealogies, there we go, uh, of kings, um, you'll discover essentially that what happens with, with Wiglaf is that uh, his dad was a guy named Wexton, and that Beowulf um, didn't have any kids, but uh, Beowulf had a sister, and the sister is not named, but she marries Wexton, and we think she has a kid named Wiglaf, and that's how he's related. Um, but Wexton would have been one of those Swedish exiles that came over um, that... Uh, Herdred, you know, accepted and started the war with Sweden. So, um, you know, like there's a lot of history in this that you don't, I guess, need to know, but it helps you sort of understand the relationships and the dynamics between them. Um, watching Beowulf, he could see how the king was suffering, burning, remembering everything his lord and cousin had given him, armor and gold and great estates Wexton's family enjoyed. Wiglaf's mind was made up. He raised his yellow shield and drew his sword, an ancient weapon that had once belonged to O'Neill, his nephew, and that Wexton had won, killing the prince when he fled from Sweden, sought safety with Herdred, and found death. Then Wiglaf's father had carried the dead man's armor and his sword to O'Neill, and the king had said nothing, only given him armor and sword and all. This is very Anglo-Saxon. Let's tell you the history of his sword. We don't know the name of his mom, but the history of his sword, we do know. I mean, like, that's, that's pretty normal. Um... Let's see. Uh, everything his rebel nephew had owned had lost when he left his life. And Wexton had kept those shining gifts, held them for years, waiting for his son to use them, wear them as honorably and as well as once his father had done. Then Wexton died and Wiglaf was his heir, inherited treasures and weapons and land. He'd never worn that armor, fought with that sword until Beowulf called him to his side, led him into war. Pause. Hold up. Wait, what? So this one guy who stayed, who's going to help Beowulf fight the dragon, has never fought a battle before? Um, a little bit of mental extrapolation tells you that Wexton, his dad, was one of Beowulf's 12 greatest warriors. He died probably last night when the dragon burned down half of Geatland, and so then Wiglaf takes his place. And so this is a green newbie who's never fought, again, fought in his life, and his first fight is against a dragon. Uh, he's fighting with a sword and armor he's never worn. And he's got a wood shield. I think you want to pay attention to that. I mean, we're going to face a dragon. He's got a yellow wooden shield. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, called him to his side, led him into war. But his soul did not melt. His sword was strong. The dragon discovered his courage and his weapon when the rush of battle brought them together. And Wiglaf, his heart heavy, uttered the kind of words his comrades deserved. Now, this is a little weird, too, I think, like, especially for us who are reading this story. Um, you know, here's here's Wiglaf uh, having to go down and help Beowulf, who's burning at the bottom of the cliff, and the first thing he does is make a speech. He's like, let me make a speech while my lord burnt. This is a very typical thing in epics. Uh, when a new character, especially an important character, is introduced, that character usually has some sort of a speech, something to set them off. So it's sort of expected so try not to think about the fact that Beowulf's burning the entire time he makes a speech. Try and think about it as a, a traditional thing to do in an epic that people are, are used to. Uh, and let's pay attention to his words. This is the first time Wiglaf has spoken. 
I remember how we sat in the mead hall drinking and boasting of how brave we'd be when Beowulf needed us, he who gave us these swords and armor. All of us swore to repay him when the time came, kindness for kindness, with our lives if he needed them. He allowed us to join him, chose us from all of his great army, thinking our boasting words had some weight, believing our promises, trusting our swords. He took us for soldiers, for men. Pause. All right, so we're, we're looking at Anglo-Saxon values here. Uh, when you make a promise, you keep it. When you brag, you back it up. These guys are failing the basic Anglo-Saxon code here. They're faithless. They don't have faith that Beowulf can be victorious. Uh, Let's see. He took us for soldiers, for men. He meant to kill this monster himself, our mighty king. Fight this battle alone and unaided, as in the days when his strength and daring dazzled men's eyes. But those days are over and gone, and now our lord must lean on younger arms, and we must go to him. While angry flames burn at his flesh, help our glorious king. By almighty God, I'd rather burn myself than see flames swirling around my lord. Pause again. So now he invokes the idea that Beowulf's old. Old people need young people to help them. Just like Rothgar needed Beowulf to help him defeat Grendel, Beowulf now needs Wiglaf to help him defeat a dragon. This is the cycle, and this is a nice parallel structure where the beginning and the end of the story are very similar. Um, also, he makes this great claim, by almighty God, he invokes God as opposed to fate, which Beowulf did when he went into the battle. I'd rather burn myself than see flames swirling around my lord. He's selfless. He's not going into this battle to earn glory. He doesn't want to have some great name in the future. Unlike Beowulf, who went into battles for his own personal glory and to, and to you know, make a reputation, Wiglaf's going into this battle for Beowulf. That's it. Uh, you know, so I think that's, that's something that's different about Wiglaf as a character as well. Uh, did I lose my spot? Um, oh yeah, here we are. Um, right up at the top. He's still in his speech, by the way. So we'll we'll continue with Wiglaf's speech. Uh, and who are we to carry home our shields before we've slain his enemy and ours? To run back to our homes with Beowulf so hard-pressed here? I swear that nothing he ever did deserved an end like this, dying miserably and alone, butchered by this savage beast. We swore that these swords and armor were each for us all. All right, that's the end of his speech. It's a pretty good end to the speech, though. I mean, does Beowulf deserve this? Every time Beowulf goes and saves everybody else, and when Beowulf needs saving, nobody's going to save him. No, he doesn't deserve this. This isn't poetic justice. Uh, he deserves to be helped. Then he ran to his king, crying encouragement as he dove through the dragon's deadly fumes. Beloved Beowulf, remember how you boasted once that nothing in the world would ever destroy your fame. Fight to keep it. Now be strong and brave, my noble king, protecting life and fame together. My sword will fight at your side. The dragon heard him. The man-hating monster and was angry, shining with surging flames that came for him, anxious to return his visit. Waves of fire swept at his shield, and the edge began to burn. His mail shirt could not help him, but before his hands dropped the blazing wood, Wiglaf jumped behind Beowulf's shield. Should be melting shield, but whatever. His own was burned to ashes. Then the famous old hero, remembering days of glory, lifted what was left of Nagling, his ancient sword, and swung it with all his strength, smashed the gray blade into the beast's head. But then Nagling broke to pieces, as iron always had in Beowulf's hands. His arms were too strong. The, the hardest blade could not help him. The most wonderfully worked. He carried them to war. But fate had decreed that the Geat's great king would be no better for any weapon. So Beowulf takes his sword. Now, by the way, it's, it's again, you know, like Beowulf's mom doesn't get a name, but Nagling, his sword gets a name. Hrunting, a sword gets a name. Um, we have a history on, on Wiglaf's sword. Grendel's mom is simply Grendel's mom. I think this tells you something about the, the masculine nature of the culture. Um, we do have some named women in here, but they're all queens or princesses. Um, so anyway, then the monster charged again, vomiting fire, wild with pain, rushed out fierce and dreadful, its fear forgotten. Watching for its chance, it drove its tusks. Terrible translation. I don't know why he would translate it as tusks. It should be fangs. It drove its fangs into Beowulf's neck. He staggered. The blood came flooding forth, fell like rain. So Beowulf gets bit in the neck by the dragon. You can imagine how big those fangs are, like T-Rex teeth. Um, and, you know, he's like pouring blood out of his neck wound. Uh, and then, when Beowulf needed him most, Wiglaf showed his courage, his strength, and the skill and boldness he was born with. 
Ignoring the dragon's head, he helped his lord by striking lower down. The sword sank in. His hand was burned. But the shining blade had done its work. The dragon's belching flames began to flicker and die away. Okay, so Wiglaf stabs the dragon, not in the head. He stabs it in the chest somewhere and, and pierces the organ that I guess would most accurately be described as the fire bladder. The, the dragon's flames like go belching or spewing out of it and it burns his hand down to like the skeleton. And he's like, ah, you know, never going to be able to use his hand again. But he's bled out the dragon's fire. Um, and Beowulf drew his battle-sharp dagger. The blood-stained old king still knew what he was doing. Quickly, he cut the beast in half, slid it apart. That's, a, that's an awkward translation, too. No, he didn't cut the beast in half with a dragon. He, he sliced it lengthwise down his entire body with this little dagger. Um, and, of course, people were like, wait, he couldn't kill it with a sword, but he can gut the whole thing with a dagger in one move? Yeah, I mean, like, the force on a sword is, like, way out on the blade, and the force in the dagger is right next to the handle. Um, and so if you're going to gut an animal, you do it with a small knife, not with a sword, and obviously that's what Beowulf does here. So, like, anybody who's familiar with cleaning animals or anything like that knows, knows how that works. Let's see, where was I? Um, the beast cut the beast in half, slid it apart. It fell. Their courage had killed it. Two noble cousins had joined in the dragon's death. Cousins here is sort of a catch-all term. Uh, back before uh, sort of more modern interpretations of cousins. Cousins is any family that's not like blood relative, like in the same way, like it's, it's not your immediate family, fathers, brothers, sons. Um, you know, any other relationship was called cousins, generally speaking. Um, yet what they did all men must do when the time comes. But the triumph was the last Beowulf would ever earn. The end of greatness and life together. The wound in his neck began to swell and grow. He could feel something stirring, burning in his veins, a stinging venom, and he knew the beast's fangs had left it. Oh, right. Anglo-Saxon dragons are poisonous. Uh, he's been poisoned. He fumbled along the wall, found a slab of stone, and dropped down. Above him, he saw huge stone arches and heavy posts holding up the roof of that giant hall. Then Wiglaf's gentle hands bathed the blood-stained prince, his glorious lord, weary of war, and loosened his helmet. Beowulf spoke in spite of the swollen, livid wound, knowing he'd unwound his string of days on earth. I mean, that's a great uh, allusion, too. Unwound his string of days on earth. That's that string in the fates. So we have simultaneous like God images and fates images sort of conflating or compounding the, the two religions that were popular at the time. Um, seeing as much as God would grant him, all worldly pleasure was gone as life would go soon. So this is Beowulf's death speech, if you will. Uh, we know he's dying. That's been foreshadowed heavily. Um, he went off to face this dragon, which represents death, and he has defeated it with the help of Wiglaf. I'd leave my armor to my son. Now, if God had given me an heir, Beowulf has no children. Um, so, you know, either he never got married or he shoots blanks. Uh, but whatever the case, he is, he is um, you know, a, a connection to Jesus, if you will. You know, like we talk about him maybe being Anglo-Saxon Jesus, maybe a miraculous birth, all of these powers, a lack of fear, going to face death by himself with 12 guys. He doesn't have a kid. Neither did Jesus, right? So, like, there's maybe another connection there. Um, let's see. Um, I'd leave my armor to my son now, if God had given me an heir, a child born of my body, his life created from mine. I've worn this crown for fifty winters. No neighboring people have tried to threaten the Geats, sent soldiers against us, or talked of terror. My days have gone by as fate willed, waiting for its word to be spoken, ruling as well as I knew how, swearing no unholy oaths, seeking no lying wars, I can leave this life happy. I can die here knowing the Lord of all life has never watched me wash my sword and blood born of my own family. Beloved Wiglaf, go quickly. Find the dragon's treasure. We've taken its life, but its gold is ours too. Hurry, bring me ancient silver, precious jewels, shining armor and gems before I die. Death will be softer, leaving life and this people I've ruled so long, if I look on this last of all prizes. So Beowulf's dying. Um, his, his greatest pride is that he's never killed his own kin. So unlike, you know, any of these other characters, whether it's, um, you know, Cain or Grendel or Unferth or Hathsin or Herdred, like there's lots of, lots of people who theoretically have killed their own kin, but he's not one of them. He's lived his life the right way. 
uh, chapter 38. Then Wexton's son, oh, every time. Um, then Wexton's son, that's Wiglaf, went in as quickly as he could, did as the dying Beowulf asked, entered the inner darkness of the tower, went with his mail shirt and his sword. Flushed with victory, he groped his way, a brave young warrior, and suddenly saw piles of gleaming gold, precious gems scattered on the floor, cups and bracelets, rusty old helmets, beautifully made but rotting with no hands to rub and polish them. They lay where the dragon left them. It had flown in the darkness once before fighting its final battle. So gold can easily triumph, defeat the strongest of men, no matter how deep it is hidden. And he saw hanging high above a golden banner woven by the best of weavers and beautiful. And over everything he saw a strange light shining everywhere on walls and floor and treasure. Nothing moved. No other monsters appeared. He took what he wanted, all the treasures that pleased his eye, heavy plates and golden cups and a glorious banner, loaded his arms with all they could hold. Beowulf's dagger, his iron blade, had finished the fire-spitting terror that once protected tower, earth mount, and treasures alike. The gray-bearded lord of the Geats had ended those flying, burning raids forever. Then Wiglaf went back, anxious to return to Beowulf while he was alive, to bring him treasure they'd won together. He ran, hoping his wounded king, weak and dying, had not left the world too soon. Then he brought their treasure to Beowulf and found his famous king bloody, gasping for breath. But Wiglaf sprinkled water over his lord until the words deep in his breast broke through and were heard. Beholding the treasure, he spoke haltingly. For this gold, these jewels, I thank our father in heaven, ruler of the earth, for all of this that his grace has given me, allowed me to bring to my people while breath still came to my lips. I sold my life for this treasure, and I sold it well. Take what I leave, Wiglaf. Lead my people. Help them. My time is gone. Have the brave Geats build me a tomb, where the funeral flames have burned me, and build it here at the water's edge, high on the spit of land so sailors can see this tower, and remember my name and call it Beowulf's Tower, and boats in the darkness and mist crossing the sea will know it. Then the brave king gave the golden necklace from around his throat to Wiglaf, gave him his gold-covered helmet and his rings and his mail shirt, and ordered him to use them well. You're the last of our far-flung family. Ugh, every time. Um, Fate has swept our race away. This is a great last speech, and I hate to have it interrupted by a page break. Take it. Oh, so I'm going to start over. You're the last of our far-flung family. What's the alliteration there? Fate has swept our race away, taken warriors and their strength and led them to the death that was waiting. And now I follow them. The old man's mouth was silent, spoke no more. He had said as much as it could. He could sleep in the fire soon. His soul left his flesh, flew to glory. Okay, so stop there for a second before we read the rest of this thing out, which is what I want to do. Um, but Beowulf dies. A lot of people are surprised. They're like, wait, Beowulf died? I thought he was the epic hero. In these epics, don't the heroes usually end up like going and living on forever? Yeah, he went to heaven. You know, I just said his soul fl uh, flew to glory. So let's talk about this final battle. I mean, obviously the dragon is fire. You know, like we have this elemental progression. Uh, the dragon represents death. And so we have this sort of old age thing going on. Um, and then, you know, like we have a couple of, of allegorical interpretations. Uh, number one is the Christian allegory. You know, a dragon is in the last few chapters of the Bible called Revelation. Um, and so the dragon could represent sort of death and that idea of revelation. And Beowulf is very much a Jesus figure here. He's coming down to face the dragon. He's coming down to face death, his own death. It's very much what happens at the end of the Bible when Jesus, um, you know, knows he's going to die and goes to Jerusalem anyway and gets betrayed by Judas and crucified. But he brings his 12 greatest warriors with him and they all, you know, sort of abandon him up there except for one. And that's what happens when he gets crucified too. Everybody denies Jesus, um, you know, by the third cock crow or whatever. Uh, you can look up the passage if you want to, but there's there's definitely a correlation here. But it seems like it breaks because at the end, Beowulf's like, give me the treasure. You know, that's not a very Anglo-Saxon thing to do, but what if the treasure isn't the treasure? What, you mean the treasure is uh, something that death is protecting and that you have to pass through death or defeat death to achieve. And if defeating death, according to the Anglo-Saxons, is going to heaven, then the treasure is heaven, metaphorically. What Beowulf sold his life for was the dragon's treasure, the thing that death is guarding. 
right? And that that is heaven. And if that's the case, then he sold his life for the treasure and he got the treasure for all of Geatland. Um, he allowed them and all of his people to, to experience this treasure too. And so that's a very Jesus moment. And I think that's one way to interpret this final scene as an allegory. In fact, you can interpret the whole thing of Beowulf as Beowulf sort of being an allegorical monk or missionary going to a foreign land and converting them. And that's fascinating to do that. Um, secondary interpretation. You guys remember Ragnarok? Well, in Ragnarok, Thor, the killer of giants, uh, faces off against a giant serpent called Jormungand. Uh, the serpent is a match for Thor. They fight. Thor kills the serpent, but the serpent has bitten him so many times that he's poisoned. He staggers back seven paces and dies. I mean, that's what happens, right? He gets poisoned by the dragon and dies from the poison. He dies exactly the same way Thor does in the Battle of Ragnarok. So more connection between Beowulf and Thor at the same time that we're connecting Beowulf and Jesus. Uh, and this overlay is interesting and probably draws pagan readers into Christian interpretations. And it's something that the, the author is trying to do here. So I think that's worth, worth considering as well. But let's talk about the allegory. How do you face death? You face it head on. You face it with a sword in your hand. You fight, and the only way to overcome death? Well, you can't. You lose. But Beowulf won, right? How did he win? Well, it turns out that, like, let's let's analyze this for a second. Beowulf goes to face against death, um, and he has he has this shield made for him. Um, you know, this shield may represent technology, the kinds of things we do to fend off death. It's going to protect him from the fire for a while, uh, but not permanently. And like, you know, nowadays we exercise and we take medications and we do all kinds of things to keep ourselves alive longer. But is it going to keep you alive forever? No. Right. And then there's a sword that breaks. Well, the sword represents Geatland and the kings of Geatland. And of course, that breaks with Beowulf. And I think that's that's clear. But swords have represented faith in this story before. What are we saying? Did Beowulf lose his faith while fighting a dragon? I don't think so. He goes to heaven. He dies with that, that metaphorical sword in his hand, if you will. And I think the idea here is that it doesn't matter how faithful you are. Uh, eventually, you're going to face death. You can pray and pray and pray and pray, and you're not going to live eternally. You can't stop death from coming. It is an inevitable occurrence in life. And again, you have to face it head on. You have to fight against it with your last breath. Put up a good struggle, uh, and that's how you how you gain access to what's beyond. And so you know, I think there's a couple of ways to look at this. So how does Beowulf defeat death? Well, he defeats death with Wiglaf. What does Wiglaf represent? Well, he was standing on top of the cliff, miserable, looking down because he's a kinsman, right? So the only person, like Beowulf brings 12 guys with him, but the only one who comes and faces death with him is his family. So maybe metaphorically what we're saying here is that the only people you can count on to face death with you are your family members. And at the end of the day, Beowulf dies and he passes his crown on to Wiglaf. And I think the idea here is the only victory that a mortal human being can have over death is to live on through their family members, um, to teach the lessons and, and the behaviors and things to those that uh, come after you. And that way you have a victory over death. You continue in this world, even though you're gone. You have your legacy and you have the family members that, that carry the love of you and, and your ideologies with them uh, wherever they go. And I think that is another way to interpret this final scene. Um, it's all pretty somber stuff and it's all pretty interesting. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and I'm going to leave you with a question that I want you to answer. And then I'm just going to do a quick lecture on the rest of what goes on in Beowulf and we'll just do it in a, in a quick shot. Um, so I think there's a question that the author is trying to get you to consider as a reader. And I think, uh, you know, it's worth your time to, to try and answer that question. And the question is, who is more brave, Beowulf or Wiglaf? and why? And uh, that's what I want you to answer in our reaction following this. So you may want to consider what your definition of bravery is. What does it mean to be brave? And then you may want to look at the, the actions of Beowulf and Wiglaf and, and consider how they play out in this final scene and make a judgment. Uh, let me know which one you think um, is, is more brave and give me your reasoning. All right, thanks.